Hi, everybody. This is an architecture talk, and yet I've been reminded um, recently how um, Giancarlo Di Carlo said that architecture is far too important to leave it to architects. And with that, I think he wasn't diminishing the role of the architect, except to say that when architecture is just about architecture, it's never very interesting or very useful. And I, I want to just really, um, before Jess talks in a minute, just describe that this is a project that is genuinely like no other um, in terms of how it was initiated, um, how it's operated and what it does, what it changes. Um, and it's been an extraordinary eye opener for me as an architect for uh, to be involved with this project for eight years. And the Onion Collective's story is the most remarkable story of any project I've ever been involved with. Um, and I suspect any project I will ever be involved with. I mean, it is the most remarkable project. Um, and I think the lessons that it offers um, every community is, is extraordinary. I mean, the lessons are extraordinary in terms of how a community can do something for itself. So first of all, Jess is going to talk about how this project came about, how they made it happen against the odds. And this is an impossible project. I mean, this project couldn't happen and yet somehow did happen in a system that is designed um, not to allow projects like this to exist. And that's why it's so remarkable. And I'm then going to do the easy bit and talk about the architecture because the architecture is always the easy bit and just describe what we had to do differently to navigate a system um, that really was designed to build car showrooms and, you know, very ordinary community halls, not a project like this. So first of all, Jess, um, let's hear your story. Thank you, Piers. Um... OK, I'm going to share my screen and um, just run through a, a little bit of an introduction about Onion Collective and what we do. This is one of the projects that we uh, run by far the most substantial uh, at the moment, uh, but but also part of a kind of wider picture of our activity um, and our way of thinking about how the economy should run, actually, in, in the kind of bigger picture. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Onion, where we came from, what we do, um, and as as Pierre said, some of the, some of the challenges. Um, I won't talk you through the many, many, many obstacles um, in any great detail because we'll be here for a very, very long time, and I'm sure we'll pick up on some of those when we when we have questions. So, just to talk a bit about who we are, really, and where we're where we're based. So this is Watch It, the little pink dot. Um, so, West Somerset on the West Somerset coast. It is actually north of the northern part of Somerset, but known as West Somerset, uh, importantly. And it's a tiny district and it was only just uh, amalgamated with Taunton Dean making a bigger one, but otherwise it was a really small district, one of the smallest in the, in the country, which has some implications. Um, this is Watch It, um, just to give you a sense, and the, you can see the harbour there, which is where we're um, located. So it's a tiny little town, only about 5,000 people, and surrounded by beautiful countryside, the Quantock Hills to one side and Exmoor to the other. Um, so a really a lovely location, looks beautiful on a nice summer's evening like this one, but underneath this kind of rural idyll, um, there are actually some fairly serious social problems um, in the area. Um, firstly, a kind of lack of cultural access, at least until um, we began working here. Um, no public art galleries actually in Somerset at all, and certainly not in West Somerset, just very small commercial um, gallery access, nothing else. Um, we, in this town, lost our major defining industry. So in, in 2015, the paper mill here, which really had been the lifeblood of the economy for a quarter of a millennium, closed down with the loss of um, about 200 jobs. And that had a really catastrophic in, impact on the town, which had always been a kind of, it's, Watch it is really beautiful, but it's also a bit grubby. Like it's kind of gritty and working and industrial and it's a harbour town. You know, it's it's not a tourist town. It's not a leisure place. It's a working place. And um, the loss of the paper mill was, was pretty catastrophic here. We're also not far from Hinkley Point and the redevelopment of Hinkley Point, which also has a really big impact economically. So at the moment, 
still the biggest construction project in Europe, I think, and um, really kind of sucking out um, particularly um, talent from, from the construction industry across the whole area. Um, the most significant issue in watch in West Somerset actually is social mobility, however. So we have the lowest social mobility in the whole of the UK, uh, which seems an extraordinary thing for a place like this. It's not obviously really deprived, but actually it is. Um, and what having low social mobility means is that disadvantaged kids growing up here have less chance of changing their future than people living anywhere else. So um, kind of by way of illustration, I guess, um, about 26% of our school leavers go to university compared to 50% nationally. So a, a really tangible impact on people's prospects and possibilities and what they believe is possible for themselves and what their aspirations are about. And all of our work really is about addressing these problems, which are broadly economic, but also cultural and social and increasingly also in environmental. Um, so we set up Onion Collective um, in 2012, so nearly 10 years ago now, um, the four of us sitting on this wall looking rather younger than we do now. Um, and we wanted to try and pool our talents. Um, we were all people who'd either um, grown up here, myself and Naomi grew up here, um, or been here for the best part of 20 years, but wanted to pool our talents and try and set up our own company that addressed some of the social and cultural justice problems that befall this area. Um, we have a really a wide range of backgrounds, and I think that is important. But we'd all been away. We, we aren't people who've stayed. We've all gone away. We've all been educated. We've all spent time in London doing various careers. So um, I worked in social um, research and in government and in think tanks. Um, Naomi uh, did a whole host of project management things, including running a zoo. Um, Rachel worked for the BBC making documentary films. Um, Georgie is our kind of comms expert and spent time at the BFI. And Sally, who isn't pictured here but joined us later, um, has a background in sustainable development. So a real kind of mix of skills that we've tried to put together. And then we've been joined um, along the journey by others. So we have two non-executive directors who offer us a kind of wealth of um, challenge and wisdom from different perspectives. Um, Tessa Jackson, um, who some of you will know and who was formerly director at the Arnolfini, um, and David Blair, who was um, the global CEO of Fitch, a kind of retail and branding agency, and who brings a kind of commercial um, challenge, I guess. And then in over the years, we've been joined by lots and lots of other people, um, including people with kind of curating and cur um, artistic backgrounds, education specialists, and increasingly everything from um, kind of mycologists to... I don't know, there's millions of us now. Um, so um, it's a big team and it's many talents. This is a picture taken of us uh, early in the summer, actually. Um, I think there are 17 of us in this picture. There's actually 28 at the last count. So rapidly growing despite the uh, difficulties of the current economy. Um, Onions a social enterprise, um, not for profit. Um, so all of our um, surpluses that we generate from any of our work are reinvested into the community, into the business and into the projects that we um, deliver. And we regard ourselves as being at the vanguard of the community business movement. So organisations which are uh, acting for, for social and community good in their decision making um, and increasingly uh, regarded as one of the kind of pioneering firms which will represent how the next economy um, needs to be run and um, just by way of an explanation i guess none of this is straightforward it's extremely complicated to set up a development social enterprise and the way we've made it work at least some of the time has been to do consultancy work all around the country with other people so with councils and with funders and with other community organizations to help them to do a similar process of community empowerment and we then use the money that we make from that to pay for all the really boring things that no one wants to pay for like rent and insurance and wages um, and planning application fees and you know other things that no funder in their right mind thinks is sexy enough to fund. So we've had to find a way to make that possible. And I think that was our first challenge. Um, we also get a lot of grant support. 
We're good at writing funding bids. We work extremely hard at it. it takes up a huge amount of our time. Um, and we've been supported by some of the most significant funders in the country. We're very proud of that. Um, I think there's a sense in which people will sometimes think that grant funding is a kind of easy route to money. It's actually an incredibly hard, difficult way to get money and comes with, uh, you know, a, a sort of years and years of, of subsequent work to demonstrate that you've done something well with the money that you've been given. Um, but we're proud of, we're, we're very proud to have been supported by some of these organisations. Um, I'm not going to talk to all of these slides, I'm just going to kind of jump through them, but this just gives you a bit of a sense of what we try and how we try and run our company, the kind of values that we seek to exhibit and portray and instill in our staff and the people that we work with. So we try and make it, you know, about compassion and tenacity, but also to think to think big picture. Um, and also to try and have some fun. Most of the time we manage that, although there are periods in this last year where <laughs> I think some of the fun bit has been rather questioned. Um, so our approach is really underpinned by community. Everything that we do comes from the community and we do a huge amount of engagement and consultation work here, um, both formally. So when we started these key project, we did a, a significant piece of town-wide consultation to ask people what they wanted. And of course, what they wanted was very messy, very complex, with lots of challenges and lots of differences of opinion. And our challenge really was to try and draw all of that together. And what happened was we drew all that together. And instead of drawing it all together and coming up with one project, we drew it all together and came up with four projects, um, making the challenge for ourselves much harder. Um, we also try and be quite ambitious. Um, I think there's a sense often that community organisations are kind of fluffy and nice and amateur and not, you know, examples of the progress which we're told to aspire to. But actually what we try and be is very ambitious to demonstrate that community shouldn't have a low bar. In fact, it should have the highest bar and we should uh, try and portray that always. We also try and take risks because many people in communities aren't able to take them and organisations which can do that for them are really critical and to be really nimble and responsive. Um, as I said before, we're, we're really consultative and responsive and collaborative. That's also extremely hard. Um, there are always people who disagree with you um, and there are always people who think what you're doing is perfect and it's really all the voices in between that we have to try and try and marshal and understand and have empathy with. Um, we see ourselves as, as in this place, addressing market and social failure. So watch it is um, sort of a place where the economy doesn't work. Like the, the prevailing capitalist system doesn't work here. No one has any money. So no one spends it. So the market doesn't really care and doesn't operate and doesn't do things. And increasingly in the last 10 years, you know, post austerity, the state also hasn't had any money and hasn't been able to do anything. And so you have this kind of real market and state failure um, in a place with some serious issues. And so we see ourselves as trying to be an organization that fits into that gap and says, how do you, how do you do this? How do you run an economy? How do you make progress? How do you create jobs when you can't rely on the usual mechanisms that make things work? As a consequence, we, tackle these four things, economic, social, cultural, environmental justice. I think it's worth saying something about cultural justice, particularly because it doesn't usually get mentioned. People often talk about economic, social, environmental justice, but not cultural. When actually access to culture is, you know, a really critical part of who we are as humans and how we learn and develop. And particularly if we're facing some of the you know, really serious challenges that we are over the next 20, 30, 40 years, this kind of need to be able to imagine and think and dream different, different ideas and different futures, um, I think is critical and art and culture play an important role in that. So cultural justice is really critical to us. And over time, what we've done is evolve really from being an organization that tried to get things going here, to set up these projects, to find out what people want and then do them, to being an organization that also thinks about a much more systems lens. So thinks about how this kind of work by us and by other organizations like us up and down the country, and in fact, globally, might lead to a systems change and might be a way to think about how the next economy could work differently and a way of kind of getting there. 
Um, I'm going to just jump past this so we haven't got time. Um, and just, I guess, to reiterate the point about engagement and participation, I think it's really critical that people recognise that engagement and participation is, you know, is serious work. There are, I'm, with apologies to everyone in the room, often critical of architects for tokenistic engagement practices where decisions have already been made and then there's a kind of let's notionally go in and maybe do a one, you know, two hour meeting with the town and they can tell us whether they like our designs or not. That's not what we're talking about. And I'm sure Piers will talk about this more, but the process of engagement that we've been through with this project has been repeated and deep and um, listened hard to what people said. That doesn't mean that we folded to everything, that we've done everything everyone wanted, but we have listened very hard to what people said and tried to respond. So this building has gone through five formal um, engagement processes. We've gone back out to the community over and over and over again and made significant changes in response to what they said. Um, I don't know if Piers will include this in his in his sketches, but there was this plan at one point to have this tower on the East Quay, which we thought was going to be great and fun and was a really important part of the business model. And the town just hated it. Like people just weren't up for it. And we had to make the decision to just say, fine, like this is your town. And if you don't want us to do that, we're not going to do it. But that stuff's really important. Like you have to, you have to do the listening and the responding. And I think I mean, we can talk about this later. It's all a question of power and engagement and so on. But um, it's re it's worth reiterating that that's a serious and challenging process that needs time and energy and quite a lot of money, actually, um, and often doesn't get done very well. Um, so just to give you a little flavour of some of the things we do, I'm gonna, I'll jump past a couple. But one of the projects I mentioned earlier, we ended up with four projects. One of them was this visitor centre and boat museum, which we did also peers worked with us on. Um, which we opened in 2016. Um, we never had any intention of running a boat museum, um, but that's what the town told us was needed, that some money and support into this organisation was needed and that the visitor economy needed, needed to be supported. And so that's what we did. And we raised um, about half a million pounds and um, refurbished um, an existing Isambard Kingdom Brunel building actually to create um, to create a boat museum and that was important because what it showed was that we would listen and also that we could get things done like it was quite quick we quite quickly raised the money it wasn't the east key it wasn't a project we had initially thought we needed to do um but it but it was a was a signifier that things could change and that we were capable and would you know put the effort in to, to really change things um we do a lot of work in social action so volunteering loosely but with a purpose um so we work with the community to understand the projects that they need and then to help people get involved in delivering those things for themselves to be part of a kind of communal team of people who will solve the project the problems that watch it has or address some of the issues often around isolation and connection um, and ways of getting people to kind of unite and do things that matter um, we're also doing a big project around uh, reimagining industry and using mushrooms to um, to grow new products, which I definitely don't have time for, but I'll maybe come back to in a few years time when it's when it's uh, more well established. Um, and then just a couple of other things, I guess we work on, um, we're working with a, a gaming company called Free Ice Cream to create a computer game which explores connection and social action and social capital, which is all, you know, is absolutely critical in everything that we do that understands these connections and this kind of web structure that holds communities together. So we're doing, you know, a whole host of things and all of those um, together, we view um, under the title of attachment economics. So it's all about how you reframe the economy to be about people, to be about connections to each other, to place, and across time. And we're exploring ways in which the kind of practice that we do actually also has implications for systems change and could be applied in other places or is relevant in other places. So a much bigger uh, picture version of something that's happening in a place-based way. Um, in terms of where this, this project came from, we started <laughs> with a tiny little project um, called Contains Art. Uh, so three shipping containers on the quayside where we are now based. And we persuaded the council um, that we should have a three-year temporary planning commission 
And we bought some shipping containers and we got a whole load of people to give up their time voluntarily to turn those shipping containers into studios and a gallery. So it, a very temporary use, um, just really as an effort to animate what was happening at East Key, which was nothing really. It was just public space left um, unused predominantly. Um, so half, it's hard to explain, I guess Piers will show you the pictures, but half of the site was really used as a boatyard and then part of it not. And we put these shipping containers in and started things happening. Um, and that ran actually for eight years, not the three, and developed into quite a significant cultural organisation, despite being animated really just in these three shipping containers and the kind of space in between, as you'll see in these pictures. And I think... Um, this kind of courtyard between the containers where things could happen and people could gather has then translated into um, a significant part of the way that East <coughs> Key was built and kind of re remains at the heart of what East Key is all about. So this space for culture and this space for gathering and coming together and kind of an easy way in to finding out about something. And the work at Contains Art, again, that's happened over these last eight years also <coughs> reflects and is reflected in everything that we've done at East Key. So a huge and significant focus on community, making sure that there's always free access to culture and that families, particularly and young people are included in activities that happen all of the time. A really significant focus on education and increasing investment in education, working with all of our schools. There are 18 schools in the area and we work with all of them um, to really embed creativity and culture in schools programs and a concern for for serious artistic practice so again in the kind of the way that community is regarded as amateur i think there's a sense in which um, art in small rural places is often regarded as something that is not significant or shouldn't be of high quality and can just be a community mural but actually there's real appetite and engagement in really very interesting artistic practice. People here are just as capable of understanding um, interesting concepts and ideas and seeing beauty as people anywhere else. Um, and here we've found that particularly there's engagement with immersive um, experiences and digital and um, kind of humor, I guess. And so we try and will continue to try to embed that kind of practice in the work that we show at East Key. So we really just got ourselves some containers and started doing some work. Um, it was harder than that, but kind of not much. Like we got some people together, we got some shipping containers, we built some studios and we got on with it. And then from that, we realized that there was scope for much, much more and that it was possible that we could actually have the ambition I talked about at the beginning, that we didn't have to settle for something small scale. And that there was this possibility on East Key, which is this site um, that Piers will talk about better than I can. But there was this possibility for something more and demand for something more. This is a, a picture of the site um, taken probably 2015. You can see the containers um, in the background. So we were just kind of squatting on the edge of this boatyard. And we began to explore whether the site could be used for something else. So previously there had been uh, plans for a big housing development here, 90 flats by Urban Splash, which fell apart for complex reasons, which I could do a whole talk on, but essentially after the 2008 crash, couldn't, couldn't work or couldn't work in a way that would deliver enough money to the council to make them want to do it. Um, and we wanted to try and find a way to do something better than that. Um, there was a planning application which was accepted here. So Urban Splash did have permission for these flats. There were hundreds of objections from the local community, um, but in the way of these things that wasn't deemed relevant and they were given permission, but did not weather the storm. Um, I want to show you this little film. It's only three minutes long, but it was made in 2014, right at the beginning. It was about probably only about three months after we started working with peers, I think. And we made it for a funder who we wanted to get the attention of. And it kind of explains what we thought we wanted to do back then um, and gives you a bit of a sense of what the town is all about. So 
I hope it will um, make it through the airwaves in a sufficient way and you'll be able to watch it. You're up, you'll get down. You're never running from this town. We're going to build. Invent, to create, to design, to build. It'll be a place for tourists to come to see makers at work, to see what they're building, to look at the gallery, to have a coffee, to grab an amazing meal, to see a performance, and all of that in this beautiful Harborside location. We're in the sixth most deprived town of Somerset and the top 10th percentile nationally for mental health issues. There are few jobs and less job opportunities. And yet this is a really strong community, a cohesive community with an industrial heritage set in an idyllic rural location. Five years ago, just after my daughter Mabel was born, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and it made me feel like I needed to just hunker down with my family and keep them safe. And it also made me feel like I needed to do something important and not waste my time and change the world. And as I got better, I realised maybe I could do those two things here. Get up, we, get down. we know that West Somerset has this huge wealth of rural skills, of creative talent. Across all ages, art and industry are the same thing. It's all about making. Makerspaces all over the world are pulling together, providing support, training and inspiration. They run a social enterprises and provide a communal workshop where people can share tools, materials and equipment. They provide a sense of purpose across generations. We found the most incredible architect in Piers Taylor, who understands our vision and who is able to create a scheme to bring it all to life. I think the point of any scheme in a place like Watch It is to take on bigger issues than just a new building. This is an amazing opportunity for Watcher because it isn't just another building delivered in a mediocre way. It's a building that could really change people's lives and change a place for the better. And it needs to do that by really getting under the skin of the character of this place. The consequences of what these buildings can do is immense because they can transform this place and really engage with people. But what we need to do that is support and investment, and that's where you guys come in. Loads of money. <laughs> we need you to give us the power to change. Um, okay, so that was 2014 which gives you a sense of how long it takes. So we kind of had a reasonable sense of what we wanted to do. Some things have changed, but we had a reasonable sense. It took us until 2017 to, to manage to get anywhere with negotiating a lease with the council and to be even close to having enough information and enough knowledge and money to get ourselves to a position where we could um, put in for planning application. So to get us to, to stage three. Um, these sketches show a little bit of the process and Piers will talk all about that, so I'm just going to jump over it. Um, but we got planning in 2018. We then eventually got in 2019 the biggest bit of funding, so £5 million from the Coastal Communities Fund. Um, I'm saying that like, oh, we just got £5 million. Like, I can't begin to express to you how hard it was to get there, how much work we did to get there. Um, the, you know, the, the months and months of work that we did on funding applications to get that money. And it was um, overwhelming to get it, extremely exciting, but nonetheless presented us with this huge challenge. So we found out in 2019, March 2019, that we had got this funding. But in order to draw it down, we had to A, start on site within six months and B, raise another one and a half million pounds to match it. And we had to get our designs to technical design to stage four in that period with no money. So the grant system was just set up to make it impossible for us. And in the end, what we had to do as an organization was borrow 150,000 pounds from the Esme Fairburn Foundation in the hopes that we would be able to get everything done and secure the rest of the money and get ourselves on site quickly enough. 
um, was a terrifying um, decision to make, but I think goes back to this point about risk taking and our decision to try and do that for the community, but also shows how hard it is for community organizations to ask people who are giving up their time largely voluntarily to then do something like borrow 150 grand to pay for architects to get themselves to a position that has been dictated to by the by the funders is a, is a crazy system. Um, but we nonetheless found ourselves in it. Um, we did all of that. We also raised another million pounds in that time and got on site in November 2019. In, 20, in December 2019, the sea wall collapsed. Uh, so we stopped. Uh, within a month of starting, we, we had this major sea wall collapse. And then three months after that, COVID hit. Um, so we stopped again. We closed the site for several months. Um, and we then um, had to raise over that period as a consequence of COVID and Brexit, another 1.3 million pounds during the pandemic to enable the building to actually complete. Um, these are kind of extraordinary challenges, even in normal times, but were um, made, um, I can't say impossible because we obviously did it, but it felt over and over again, like we were simply not going to get there and that we might seriously have to mothball this building not long after we'd started um, building it. Um, nonetheless, we did all of those things and we got on site and we continued to build throughout the pandemic um, and to raise money and to enable it to happen. And these are just some of the pictures. I think one of the other thing I want to point out is that for the last month of this build, um, Onion and all of our team, by this time about 20 of us, were so frustrated that we weren't open um, we were only about six months late, which in the scheme of COVID, et cetera, is really not that bad, but it felt like we were so frustrated that we got all of our team on site. We persuaded the builders, the main, I'm persuaded, we maybe just told them, the main contractor that we should help. And we literally put everyone in a hard hat and we got into the building site and we helped and we did everything from, um, we, we just did, we did a bit of everything. We sealed concrete floors, we cleaned everything, we tidied up relentlessly after all of the building team. We did everything we could to try and push the building forward. And at the same time as all of that, we were trying to set up a building. Um, we were trying to hang and install an exhibition in a building site. We were trying to plant all the plants for the building. We were Sally trying to learn how to use a coffee machine. We had to do all of this stuff in the middle of a building site and in the middle of a, a pandemic. Um, so it was kind of beset with challenge. Um, nonetheless, we opened in 20, uh, on the 20th of September, 21. Piers will talk to you about the building and how wonderful it is. He won't say that, but it is completely wonderful. And I just want to mention some of the things that have happened since. We've only been here two months now, but these are the things that we're doing. And these are the reasons it exists. So Piers often talked to us early on about how really it wasn't about the building. For an architect, nonetheless, it wasn't about the building. It was about all the stuff that happens in the building. And this is all the stuff that's happening in the building now. So cultural and creative work by artists in their own studios and in the galleries of the highest quality being shown in this tiny little town on the West Somerset coast. Um, an education and learning program in an extraordinary education learning space um, designed by another architecture practice, Pierce plus Fane, who worked with the local school children to design an anti-classroom and is now being occupied and utilized by young people of all ages. Um, we have around 20 people earning a living here outside of Onion staff. So artists and makers from the paper mill, where they make some of the best paper in the world actually back in Watch It, um, to a print studio, to a photographer, all kinds of different artists and makers working in the building and selling their wares and showing their trade. We're running, of course, a restaurant, which we are running ourselves actually, and uh, a shop, both of which also contribute to the way that we think about how the economy should be run. So everything in the shop is either a social the product of another social enterprise or is creative in some way to help young people and, and, and in fact anyone um, continue their creative journey. And the restaurant endeavours to be as sustainable as possible and responsible as possible. We only have two meat dishes on the menu. So we're trying in every way that we run the place to think about the social and environmental impact of it. Um, 
We also have these extraordinary places to stay, um, again, designed by Pierce plus Fane, who did, who did the education space, and um, which you can book. In fact, you can now book, there you go, a bit of, bit of a PR, live on our website. Um, they're available from February. But the important thing about them is really that the money that they earn will be reinvested. That's how we're making the business plan stack up. So we're making the most of the tourism pound. We're creating these extraordinary places to stay, which make the most of this extraordinary site that we have. And then we use that money to um, prop up and pay for education and cultural work. And of course, most significantly, events and community, mm -hmm. most of which so far has happened in this beautiful courtyard space, um, which echoes what happened with Contains Art, um, and which has invited and invested in hundreds and hundreds of people already coming to all kinds of things from fireworks to theatre and is kind of really exciting and just what we've just started so we're two months in we've done all of this and we'll continue to do it um, and I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Piers. Thanks Jess I'm going to talk uh, for about hopefully about 15 minutes and as I said my bit is the easy bit Someone asked me why the Onion Collective used uh, Invisible Studio. And I think one of the reasons is that I've been mulling over this is that we, I, well, I think I have a deep suspicion of architecture um, and I'm highly suspicious of high architecture, in fact. But at the same time, I think I'm acutely aware of architecture's power and the potential to bring about change. But there's a kind of architectural narrative I'm just going to spend five minutes or so unpicking. So Jess's story is, is an amazing one. And I think one of the other interesting questions that somebody asked when they came to visit was, would this building been, have been different if it had been commissioned by four men? And I think the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, and we can mull over that. Um, so Jess has, in fact, orientated us into where Watch It is and identified that these things needed to be solved and what the area of impact for those things were. And these things for me as an architect were so kind of profound that every time I start a new project with my students, we always begin by looking at the area of impact, the social territory and the physical territory. Where does this place affect and how can we get under the skin of what it does? Then we can do the building and then at the end of that, we can look at whether or not it's done those things. So this is, um, watch it just from you know, an aerial view. And I think what's interesting about looking at it here is that it's a place made up of incredibly small buildings arranged in an ad hoc manner that's obviously evolved in kind of one direction around a harbor that is no longer um, busy. And that no longer busy was a kind of sense of loss that I felt acutely when I went there, like many places in the United Kingdom where industry had um, withered and died. None of those jobs have been replaced by anything substantial. So, um, you know, typically if you leave school now, you can work in cost cutter or whatever else. There is incredibly low aspiration in a place which incredibly recently was incredibly proud. And the sense of industry, the sense of making, was was all around, in fact. Um, Jess mentioned that there were four ideas, and in fact, I won't talk about them because Jess did. But one of the first things I think we really looked at was um, East Key is the you know yellow um, highlit area uh, over on the right-hand side of my screen. And the, the piece of public realm that is in Watch It is extraordinarily good quality. I mean, this is a place that you can walk around easily. It has person-sized spaces that are interesting. You know where you are, you're orientated in the town. And yet the site is divorced from the town. And you know, one of the questions for us was how could we make this site part of this place when it was a building that was 20 times bigger than anything that existed in the town and was detached from it? From it. And one of the main ways that has been consistent all the way through the multiple iterations of the scheme was that it had to connect into all of the routes that run along the back of the site, which is the, the steam railway, the footpath, which is the coastal um, southwest coastal path, the route up to Govia's Lane and uh, the, the bit of town that Jess and her family live in, um, and also connect as a piece of formal public realm into the Esplanade. So in some ways, it's all about the kind of connections. 
this is the site over on the right hand side before there's a, a boat yard, a boat shed that was demolished. And this is the site as we sort of found it. And if you look at the site, it's just beyond where the masts are. And the buildings that exist along the top of that are two story domestic scale buildings. And we were going to do a three story building on this site. You know, the question is, how could you do it? How could we begin to do something here that not only addressed um, the Onion Collective's brief, but also belonged here? And as you can see, there's this incredibly striking masonry plinth that defines um, the town. It kind of is the town, this strong plinth that wraps around everywhere that protects you in some ways from this sort of weather that batters this um, site. And above it are these very small person scale buildings kind of everywhere. That is the town, you know. Um, and in fact, as you look at this now without the building, this kind of was the building before we built the building. I mean, it really was a kind of obvious thing to do what we ended up um, doing. It's also a conservation area, which I think is really interesting. So this was the site as we um, found it in 2013, 2014. And it's kind of interesting, the age of this. So 2014 to now is the whole of the Beatles career from, you know, love me do and please, please me to the Abbey Road and the end. I mean, it's an extraordinary lifetime in a, in a kind of creative project. Um, so again, these were the containers that Jess um, talked about, and this was the space between those containers that was super interesting. It's where people were drawn to, they provided a weather break, they provided a focus at the end of the Esplanade where I'm standing, taking this picture, looking into the site with the path, the coastal path and the railway behind. This was the 90 unit approved scheme on the site that everybody hated. Um, and then this is the place that is a, an amazingly rich piece of um, geology and geography. I and mean, it's a Triassic coast, heavily stratted Triassic coast, this blue lias that, you know, runs along in these incredible seams. And there also is a history of building things that deal with weather in an unusual and interesting way on this site. And a history of, um, you know, things that um, I guess can deal with this extreme um, climate. So all of this stuff was, was early, you know, getting to know the site and thinking about how we might do something here. And this just shows again, the character of this place, which is this plinth that runs around this public realm with these small scale things everywhere, nothing bigger than a kind of two and a half story house um, really anywhere on this. And yet this piece of West Somerset has some of the most remarkable pieces of um, built landscape in the world, actually. And I, and I, that's no overstatement. Bottom left is Clevedon Pier. It's a grade one uh, listed structure that you can walk out onto um, as a piece of elevated public realm and look back at the town and look out to sea. Um, and in a way, that is what we, of course, ended up doing at East Quay. Top left is the, the little, um, uh, I don't even know, it is. A, I don't think it is a lighthouse. I can't actually remember what it is, but it's a Burnham on Sea, but a remarkable kind of stripy building on stilts with a little staircase going up to it. I mean, they're kind of quirky and unusual and kind of brilliant. And then, you know, top right, the way that you would navigate up through this cliff, this incredibly strong masonry base that takes you up through it, up to the, the piece of up. This, of course, is, is Clevedon Pier. And then the town itself has no architect, you know, no architect has really worked here. And, and I would say the town is all the better for it because architecture ruins places like this typically. And these places are so informal. And I, I'm going to use this word plural. I mean, this is a, word, a, a place where people can kind of do anything because there's a kind of system of public realm. There's buildings that have been extended in an informal and ad hoc way. Nothing is precious. And when we consider architecture, we make buildings that are fixed, immovable and precious. And yet this, this place is, is hyper generous. Anyone can kind of do anything to any of these buildings and it doesn't matter and it doesn't affect the place and it doesn't make the place any worse. And that's what we had to do. We had to make a bit of this, this plinth with some things on top that could really be built in any fashion by anybody, which I'll talk about. This is the, the built context of the railway that runs along the back of the site, these kind of quirky little tin buildings. And yet this is the culture that I came from, this kind of, you know, extremely severe orthodox modernist culture you know i studied with a with a kind of hyper modernist and this is the dogma that is highly destructive for architecture where it's a male 
dominated world where people conceive of things that in the, in, in the design of an object are so complete that they can never engage with the real world. When in this repulsive story of the Fountainhead, this building did come upon the, against the real world, it, it was destroyed by its creator because it, it was designed never to touch the real world, you know, because again, things are handed down from a master as a piece of form and taste, as something that is immovable. If something is wrong with it, it's society that is wrong, not the, not the architecture. So most architects' favourite building is, of course, the Barcelona Pavilion, which is so fixed and so static that it doesn't even have a purpose. It doesn't even have a function and it doesn't even ever have people in it. And yet, if you ask an architect why it's a good building, they'll tell you because it's a, a controlled grid within a grid within a grid. You know, I mean, it's kind of absurd. You can't make this stuff up. And yet this is what I was schooled in. You know, And again, buildings like this that are revered and yet have never had a purpose, could never be used and are useless. And this building, you know, Peter Salter's building, this photograph by Elaine Binet, built by Mole Architects and commissioned by Crispin Kelly, who went to the AA. And it's on the market for 27 million. It couldn't be, it's a useless building. It could never be sold. And yet this is revered by architects. It's not controlled in the manner of the Barcelona Pavilion. And yet it is a Barcelona Pavilion. Because if you look at this building next to it, this is a footballer's house in Wilmslow. And we sneer, but these buildings are identical. They are identical because the only thing that is different is what shape they are and what color they are. The spirit in which they are conceived is identical. And this is our problem, you know, because in the end, everything that architects do is framed by this value system, which is only the production of form and taste. And, you know, how on earth could you bring all of that shit to watch it, to do something in the kind of, with the generosity of what the onions were trying to do? <laughs> I wrote, read a review of Flora, Flora Samuel's book about why, why architects matter. And, you know, what was really, really interesting was that they used a picture of this building, which I worked on, as an example of how to do it differently. And yet still, what was absurd about this building was that we, we, we were confusing radical making with radical thinking. Radical making is not radical thinking. Whatever shape a building is, whatever color it is, it could never be radical. Whereas these buildings that are built by ordinary people in an accessible manner are really hyper interesting and are, I think, quite extraordinary. I've always been interested in these kinds of buildings because what I like about these buildings is that they're incredibly accessible. This place of Watch It was also highly suspicious of architecture. You know, if you brought a Barcelona to um, a pavilion to watch it, people would think you were absurd. And yet these buildings that can be built by anybody in any manner with anything are hyper accessible and amazing examples of how you can make usable person-sized structures in an incredibly informal manner. This is Bath where I live. And if I look at this building that's straight ahead and the building on the right, this is conceived of by an architect. And yet the changes have been made by non-architects. And I would argue that the buildings are better because of the changes that have been made by non-architects, the placement of the windows, the placement of the down, the down pipes. They, this, this hyper controlled model has been made better by the kind of the informal things that have been added on in the same way that the backs of terraces that we all know are much more interesting than the fronts of terrace, terraces. You know, as a kind of um, uh, trying to become a, you know, Brexiled person post-Brexit, you know, can't live in the UK. I'm spending more and more time in Greece, where I've lived in part for 50 years in any case. And this place was a, has defined most of, again, what I've thought about East Quay, which is how is it that a place like this that really is, again, a little piece of East Quay can exist without architects and make spaces that are so extraordinary. And if you look at this, this again is what East Key is. It's a hyper-defined piece of informal public realm that is a person-scaled street with buildings adjacent to it. The buildings are less important than the place. The buildings are informal, ad hoc. They're not 1780 or 1880 or 1980 because no one cares and no one minds. This is never about a building. This is only ever about a place, because if you talk about a building, you can't make places. And yet, if you look at buildings, again, that are designed by non-architects, the arrangement of windows could never happen by an architect. An architect couldn't let himself, I would say, I say himself, 
do this because this cannot be designed in the manner in which we are schooled. These kind of buildings can, these kind of quirky, informal, unusual, exceptional buildings can. Quickly before we get into East Key, again, the project is a piece of urban design, much like Almere in Holland, where going through our mind was how can we do something where we could lose control of this at any stage. And of course, as an architect, we've worked on quite a lot of master plans where you always have to think, what happens if the worst developer comes in and infills your scheme? How can you do something that retains its integrity when anyone can do anything? And in this scheme, another architect built it. We didn't really even have a conversation. They never once asked us anything about the scheme and they changed quite a bit. And it kind of doesn't matter. The building is a bit worse, but it doesn't matter because of the big move that we put in place at the beginning. And I think that's hyper interesting and a completely different model of architecture from, from obsessing about a kind of window position. So of course, Almer in Holland has rubbish buildings. If you look at these buildings, they're rubbish. And yet the place is extraordinary. It's an amazing community and it holds together because of the big move, which is the planning of how the pieces fit together and the informality of it in the same way as Lincoln, in the same way as Saffron Walden, in the same way as Castle Coombe. And this, of course, is the point of all of this, which architecture does only exist if it engages with the world. And yet all of our schooling is is trying to pretend the world doesn't exist so we can default to a grid within a grid within a grid, photograph it without people and never let anyone anywhere near it and pickle that beautiful jewel in aspic forever. Like Corbusier tried to do in Pessac, you know, he tried to do that. And of course, when he went back 30 years later and asked what had happened, he was told people had added their needs. You know, I mean, it's kind of extraordinary. People had added their needs because Corbusier couldn't do that. Again, I mean, I kind of feel embarrassed showing this because it, East Key is so obvious as a kind of piece of architecture. Because again, it just does what many other people have done, like Elemental in Chile. They didn't have enough money to build a whole house, so they built they built half houses where people could come and then infill and do anything. So this is what they built. And of course, this is how it was then filled in. What I love about this project most is really the comments on disease for architects who say this is an aesthetic disaster. This is a place that is the most successful piece of urban design I know. It's one of the most successful pieces of architecture I know. It's the most loved by its community piece of architecture. I know. And it was initiated by an architect who then walked away and let anything happen. And I think that's a remarkable lesson to how we need to, to lose control. Um, we need you know, to allow others to gain control. And I kind of think if you do the right thing at the beginning, anything can happen. You know, So that's what we did. And this is the very first sketch I just found again today, actually, which was the big move, which is a plan that pushes itself up to the, the coastal path at the back that then spills out into these, these public spaces and the buildings sit around that. In elevation, we, we engage with this public um, uh, path at the back at this midpoint. Um, and that you know was all of the iterations of the scheme were that. They were a kind of piece of public realm that was as generous as possible that allowed you to look into a courtyard with pieces of building alongside them that kind of you know were placed in, a, in an informal and ad hoc manner. All the same scheme, big plinth on the bottom that pushed itself into the back of the, the scheme and then opened up to the railway, opened up to the coastal path, made public realm and then reduced the scale and the size of the building as we went up. That's the tower on the left hand side in one iteration that Jess talked about. I'm a bit embarrassed by it actually, but um, the the then you know this is then the the footprint of the building, which is a place that makes a courtyard that contains all of the big stuff that connects into all of these routes at the back that allows the public realm from the Esplanade at the front to come past this scheme. Um, that's another sketch of the town. I'm not quite sure what it's doing there, actually, anyway, in the wrong place. That's Mark's um, landscape scheme, Mark Dix. Um, uh, maybe Mark, if he's here, can talk about this in, in um, the questions at the end. And then this shows the big stuff that goes in the plinth, in the heavy masonry plinth, that in a way, um, uh, if you go there, um, sort of, uh, it, in a way, it feels like it is... Um, Actually, I'm not going to say that because that sounds really wanky. Um, someone said something to me about the way, that it, anyway. Um, the big stuff um, above that, this for me is the most interesting story, which is 
all of the the white around the buildings is this street, this first floor street that is um, open 24 hours a day with studios, the gallery at first floor, the creator space, um, other studios, and three little holiday pods on this with diminishing size courtyards on, are around them that are all public and yet only ever imply privacy for a bit of it. You can walk anywhere in the scheme at any time. And the only privacy is made by implying privacy through the, through the placement of a building. The, the buildings aren't willfully ad hoc. They're designed so that they could be anything. And when the money, at the beginning of the project, we never knew um, how much money there would be or whether all of the infill pieces would be um, commissions um, later or would happen as self-bills. So all of these were designed as little quirky things that that weren't fixed and static. They were kind of plural. They could be anything. They could be any color. They were suggestive. This is the plinth that then is, is the core comes up. The big things of the, the gallery, um, the, the first floor gallery, there's a ground floor gallery as well. The major studios are then built as part of the first phase. And then over time, the idea was that these other buildings you know, would infill them. As it happens, they got all of the money at one time. But what is amazing is that instead of the contingency being people doing self-built projects, another architect took on the scheme at stage four and delivered it. And I think it is really, really interesting that we never really had a conversation about it. They changed it and it doesn't kind of matter. I mind, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. And letting go of all of that stuff that I would have controlled historically is a kind of liberation, actually. And of course, then this is the scheme. You know, this is you know, it's. And I think I just put this other early sketch in just to kind of orientate people. So this is, you know, the, the street that runs around that connects into you can walk up through this into the coastal path and all the other things sitting around it that could be anything. And they are di they are different from from this slightly, which I think is kind of interesting. So these are, you know, planning application drawings um, and um, then, you know, initially suggesting at planning application stage how we'd have this kind of concrete masonry base, these lightweight sheds on top that, you know, I've often wondered what the point of all the stuff I've been kind of doing in, in the woods here over kind of 20 years has been. And I think some of it has been to kind of allow the improvised a way into architecture. And what I like about the buildings at East Quay is that they are in this family about kind of the improvised buildings that sit on top of something that's much more permanent. They're, they're, they're kind of, you know, tentative things that could change. And some of these courtyards, again, I hope will get infilled and changed and developed, and maybe there'll be more buildings built on top over years, who knows. So then that is the, the scheme. And then this now is just as it, is so this is the aerial view looking into the courtyard um looking sort of northeast into the courtyard the plinth the gallery the two uh, containers that are still there um the the way in in the sort of center um the first floor with the two accesses that you can see with the, the stairs going up another access in from the coastal path through the buildings in the corner and that is a real street that is used by people um, to access the coastal path and all sorts of other things. And then, you know, the building's getting quirkier and more informal and more lightweight as they um, as they go up. Pod two, three more pod, holiday pods on top. As Jess said, were fitted out by another architect again, the sense of multiple hands. It's kind of like anyone could come and work here. And I kind of like that. Um, you don't need to control architecture like this in the way that we usually control it. That doesn't mean to say it's uncontrolled. This is, I just put in because Pippa was really interested in, in people being able to understand how it works. So looking directly down into the courtyard, first floor street above, bridge connecting through, courtyards around the back where people hang out, have a party, do a bit of welding, have a fag, whatever. They're kind of essential to a, to a sort of generous public scheme. Looking down one of the streets at the end, looking along on the right, you'll see this is the scheme. It's kind of, you know, plinth with um, some sheds, uh you know on it and that's what we did and my friend meredith who came to look at it said yeah you've done the right thing you made a plinth with some tat on top that's what i would have done looking along the the railway um uh and seeing again um how this this building i say that right the tat on top as a joke of course because this building is 
is is highly respectful of the buildings that are there if you look at you know of course it's kind of obvious the picture kind of says it you know how how this building is part of this place i mean it feels like a little bit of watch it um you know there's one of the, the interiors of one of the pods that you can now rent as jess said and um stay in um this is this bridge this is my favorite bit of the scheme bridge into the first floor from the coastal path which um then brings you in to this place this piece of public realm used by skateboarders you know um late at night I took that photograph that's that street looking down into the courtyard um again a guy walking his dog i took the other night just going up there walking his dog past a gallery you know art and life just coexisting you know on a dock side not a place like margate that keeps the world out uh, the gallery at margate of course and then he's going through into the corner onto the coastal um path that's that the courtyard gallery on the right hand side and shop um and main entrance cafe um on the left um there um uh plinth lightweight stuff even lighter weight you know studio top light uh, on the right uh, one of the b and b pods looking into um the shop which is that looking through to the gallery um down into you know the, this is where jess is now in fact in this space which is the 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 cafe that they of course run looking into the gallery um the paper mill um and that's it in fact so hopefully um there'll be some questions uh, mainly for jess i think because the initiation of this i think is much more interesting than than anything else and the lessons for every community i think you can stop sharing yeah thanks i agree with rich porter thank you both we'll, we'll do a round of applause at the end it's very messy but we love to do it um thank you both so much what a whirlwind tour virtual tour of east key and and the thoughts behind it um we we do have some questions first of all we have a very technical question because fiona Gle engineer fiona gleed is in the audience Fiona, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yep, I can say so thank you, Jess and Piers. That was so interesting. I, I will, as well as being an engineer, my parents live in West Somerset, so I did manage to get to the visit the building um, on the way to Minehead Hospital last month. So um, I was wondering about the coastal erosion, which I know is a problem for the railway. How has that been taken into account in the design of the building and in planning for the, the future of the onion? So I touch on that very quickly. So um, it's all made up ground and it was really interesting and in how just how patronizing some people were to think that they kept saying to the onion collective, you can never build on that site. And of course, you know, as you will know, as an engineer, you, know, you can, of course, engineer it. And I think um, it is, um, in fact, the building is on natural ground. It's from the building down towards the edge of the marina that is made up ground. So the building actually doesn't sit on made up ground, which is actually one of the reasons that it is pushed back um, against um, the, uh, the bank, which is a retaining piece of retaining structure actually to hold the railway up. It doesn't touch the bank because touching the bank suddenly becomes problematic. One of the reasons that we didn't build the cafe is that the cafe is in an old um, uh, harbour building that does hold the bank up and the um, it was going to cost something like a million quid just to take the building back down to get back to a position that we could build the cafe on. And I think the whole of that budget was, you know, a million quid to do everything for that bit of it. So that hasn't happened. Um, the 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 harbour itself is, I mean, the harbour can fall down and the building will be fine, which is interesting. And the harbour did fall down, actually. The, this is the, the edge of the marina, rather. That did fall down and then... Um, you know, the, the council are still, I think, repairing it, putting sheet pile in and backfilling. There was also a hole in the harbour wall, um, which came through at one, one big storm. So, you know, in a way it's engineered around it, but I think in simple terms, the building doesn't depend on any um, badly built, made up ground or existing piece of structure to hold it or its foundations. It's kind of independent and it, it sits on natural ground, in fact. Jess, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things 
so so I mean, for people who care about these things, it's it's floated. The foundations is a, a concrete float rather than piled um, to distribute the um, weight of the building. And of course, we did an extraordinary amount of work to make sure that it was going to be OK um, because of concerns about the harbour wall. Subsequently, the council have invested a huge amount of money in fixing the harbour wall, not least because, as Pierre said, it, the sea came through um, at a really bad time. Um, just to add to the fun, we've had the council fixing the harbour wall for the whole period. Um, but it feels now secure. The whole of the building is also raised up because of flooding concerns. So it's not actually in a, in a high risk uh, flood area, not least because of because it is already built as this kind of strong plinth against, against the sea. But the whole of the building is raised up significantly to, in, to, to provide extra assurance, I guess. Um, it's been interesting the last few weeks. There's been some pretty hefty weather down here, not least on our opening party, which we finally had um, at the end of November. Um, and all, it, it pretty much was fine. <laughs> there were a couple of things where we were like, oh, new leak. Um, but, but mainly it, it had a real sense of safety and solidity against anything the world will throw at it which was kind of wonderful. And there was this real sense of safety and warmth in these walls against kind of ocean, which I think if you live in a place like Watch It, you're kind of used to needing and um, was, was, was nice to feel. So I think it's been considered. I think the other thing to say is that we, in our work, um, in thinking about how we change, have conversations about environment, how we think about climate, how we think about how people adapt, we're also um, considering all of those questions in our programming, in the kind of work that we curate, in the artists that we work with. And so there's the kind of technical building question, but I think there's also a kind of hearts, minds, ideas, imagination, solutions question, which the building tries to, um, will try to address in some of the work that we do. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, everyone. Um... The cleaners just arrived, so I got a bit distracted. <laughs> um, uh, I have a question from Julie Tanner. Julie, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes. Hi. Hi, Pierce. Hi, Jess. Um, I don't know if you recall way back we did a design review. Do you remember those heady days of um, design development or whatever? And um, yeah. Yeah. and brought the local authority along. And I, and I hope we helped a little to, cr yeah. to kind of... You did you know, give the local authority confidence that doing something this magical in this location would have been a brave, a brave next step. And um, I'm just so delighted to see everything's come together after all, all these years of hard work and whatever. Um, this is where I met Mark Dix for the first time, actually, and Mark's been a very active member of our panel. So I'm just interested in... Um, the landscape strategy and just how fundamental that was pierced to how the design came together because I, I know we constantly in design review ensure that uh, we'll ask the question how engaged and how integrated has the, the landscape strategy been to the whole sort of concept and um, how, how the placemaking strategy comes together so just wanted your thoughts on that but supplemental to that really um, I, I love Piers, how you refer to uh, a woman-led scheme being fundamentally different. And I would just wonder how that public realm may reflect the fact that, you know, women are at the heart of the scheme, really. Yeah. So I think Mark might be here. So if he is, he can probably do this better than I can. But I think the first of all, design review was super useful because I remember explicitly that the letter that was written um, and Peter and Juliet Bidgood were on the panel. They It said this scheme must be built just like this. You know, it's kind of just it, it's an extraordinary opportunity to do something. It doesn't need to be, you know, it, it pulled apart and changed. I think that um, the landscape, what I love about the landscape is that it's super light touch it looks as if it's just inevitable and yet it has of course been 
thought about, and it's a highly sophisticated piece of design by um, by Mark. I think that one of the things that everybody loved initially was the the scent, the roughness, the sense of the old boatyard um, as a kind of texture and. Everyone wanted something that wasn't precious, in, and that's really hard to do. So the landscape itself is as close to what was there as we could possibly do. I mean, there are bits of the old landscape that have been broken up and reused there. Um, the the way that the planting is is hyper subtle, and there is a kind of band of planting that um, just sort of signifies that. Um, the courtyard is a different space from the rest of the public realm. That's been really thought about. And it's obviously um, a piece of landscape that acts as a kind of threshold that takes you into the courtyard. And it's really subtle, I think, because if the courtyard was just part of the Esplanade, it would feel completely different. There's just enough of a barrier. And over time, that will change. And they're really hardy plants and grasses. Again, perhaps Mark can talk about that. And then the kind of landscape, the urban landscape at first floor, which is a piece of hard you know urban realm that connects into the um uh the the bank is really critical as well so just knowing how much to do and knowing when enough is enough i think is a, has been the the key lesson there is mark here tonight yeah i'm here oh yeah, great do you yeah, want to yeah. talk about it mark i'm sorry i probably yeah, just said sure. entirely the wrong thing but no 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 absolutely fine piers I, I think one of the key things about the landscape arrangement and the way that the um the external spaces work is all about connectivity so there's this really strong um, rationale and existing function that the esplanade provides which is all about um, uh, public access and public meeting by by uh, by the harbor and and really what all that the landscape is doing is is connecting to the esplanade and leading people through into the heart of this new building. Um, so it's it's visually very strongly connected, but also physically connected. And beyond the courtyard, the other really key connection is the bridge that, that Piers has talked about. And, and actually how that links into the Southwest Coastal Path, which then leads you up to Splash Point, which is this uh, promontory behind the site, which you can then look back onto the site. Um, we did want to do some other connections at certain points throughout the design process. Um, uh, for, for various reasons, they weren't possible, but the way that the, um, that the permeability of the site works, um, it's, it's, it's just um, uh, really great to see people now gathering in the courtyard and using the connections as we hope they would. You never really know, but um, people, people have really responded well to it. I think it's just worth mentioning as well, during that um, design review panel, um, P Peter Clegg saying, there's no way you're going to be able to get the services to work. This is way too complex. It's going to be an absolute nightmare. Um, but, and, you know, in, in many ways, Peter was right because it was very difficult. But the, um, the desire by all the team meant that it did work in the end. And that's just another great example of persistence i think persistence is the word on this project for for all of that that time and the endings have been so persistent and the whole design team have been so persistent and every project every project needs that and it was you know in spades on this one I, can i say a couple of things i think um the landscape design is a good example of one of the things where the community basically said you haven't done this well enough to us so in the first or second time we went out to the community with designs, it was very building focused. And I get that's just reflected where our attention was at the time. And very strongly, we got a response from the community, which was, what about, what about all of the public realm here? What about the planting? What about these connections? You haven't like, this is insufficient and caused us to go back and really kind of rethink that and put some serious time and effort in. And was a good, a good example of the community saying like, yeah, okay, great, but you've not, you've not got all of this sorted yet, please go back and do it again. Um, and the other thing I think is worth saying is, uh, I think has been touched on, what's really beautiful about the landscape here is it doesn't look like anyone's tried very hard. It looks pretty much like a boatyard, but making a non-shiny new landscape is really, really difficult um, to make it not feel like a brand new thing put there, to make it feel like it's just the extension of what's going on was really, really hard. I mean, I think the uh, landscape contractors here 
I mean, really got very fed up with us repeatedly asking them to redo the concrete and the amount of stones and how well they were scattered and whether or not they were, how deep they were in and so on, in order to get to a point where we felt like it, it just felt like it was always there rather than it had been put in fresh. It's, um, it's, it's worth mentioning too that the concrete uh, that forms the external surface finish is exactly the same concrete as the building with additional material laid in top, on, on the top. So you get this kind of seamless connection between the two and it just makes it feel like it's part of the building. Yeah. What about the initiated by um, four women, Jess? That was one of other Julie's last questions. <laughs> How is it different from... Um... I mean, it, there's a post-rationalisation, isn't there, that actually what we've done is build a pink building that's vaguely V-shaped on a harbour in Watch It. Um, but that is... No, I think it's more than that. I think that wasn't the beginning intention. It is just what's happened and was is, in fact, due to the predominantly male architects who designed it. No, um, I think it's also the generosity. You all had babies, really, when... At yeah. a, and actually that sense of... The kind of multiple things coexisting the generosity of it i think is is very feminine i think also i mean i think this um the repeated attention to it being about a place for gathering a connection mm -hmm. is you know clearly it comes from us I, mean, I don't mean that men don't need that too but i think it reflects where we all were and where we've come from and what we're doing and the kind of activity that we all support so um in as much as that's some sort of reflection of femininity, I guess that, that comes through pretty strongly. Thank you. I've got, I've got a question really, I think, directed it to you, Jess. Um, Emma, do you want to ask the question? Unmute yourself. So done. Um, yeah, hi. Um, mine was just building on, again, I'm in awe of the whole talk. It was, it's just so beautiful and um, such a lesson on so many levels. It's really impressive. Um, almost quite emotional in a given time. We're in seeing it all come together. So mine was sort of related to the persistence, really, and that strength of um, passion and commitment. And how did you, together, I think I know the answers, but how did you, how did that persistence come through to see that space for gathering and all that important social aspects I'm interested in? And how, how did you keep going? There's so much bureaucracy and red tape and people putting obstacles in your way, presumably. Um, I'm just, it's just, yeah, I'd be interested in how you kept it, kept going, basically. Um, I mean, I wonder sometimes. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, this sort of whole project, the project sort of feels like it was just obstacles. Um, and it's one of the things that I find most frustrating, I think, about it, that we're sort of regarded as having done really well for being tenacious and resilient. And isn't that great? And aren't we good? And then lots of effort is put into figuring out ways in which we can help community organisations be more tenacious and more resilient instead of putting loads of time and effort into getting the obstacles out of the way. Like, why should we, or any other community for that matter, who are simply trying to do something good for their area and their people, somehow have to build up a whole skill set of fighting battles which are put in their way by usually finance the councils, private developers, you know, why is it our job to do that? Actually, it should be the job of local authorities to get the obstacles out of the way. It should be, you know, it should be the job of other people because it doesn't make sense that the people who are, you know, already doing all of this, usually on top of their whole other life and job, also have to be incredibly resilient and tenacious. Frustration. Nonetheless, we were. And I think that the reason we were able to do it was each other. And your collective is a collective, like that's a really important part of it. There are some amazing community entrepreneurs who are individuals and who have achieved great things. But actually, if you look at the community enterprises that are really succeeding, they tend to be several people. And I think you need that. I don't think you can keep going if you haven't got someone who's gonna be up when you're down and who's gonna mop up your tears and buy you a pint of cider and find a way to be optimistic when you aren't. So I think um, that collective sense um, is kind of all, all important and is always the thing when people say, you know, we often get asked, how do we do this? What's, you know, what's important? And I always say, find some other people. First thing you've got to do is find some other people and, you know, preferably people you really, really like and want to spend a lot of time with and you don't mind crying in front of. Like, you know, these women are my greatest friends and that's how we were able to achieve this. 
Um, and I think that, you know, that doesn't get talked about enough and is, it, it is, is a really critical part of what makes things possible. It's also, I mean, from my perspective, there's, there's an amazing balance of personalities and skills where everybody brings something very different and essential. Someone told me the other day, I think it was Georgie, that, you know, there were, there were of course, you know, 500 times the project could have stopped in general terms, 50 kind of specific times. And Naomi, in fact, who is your sister, was the one that, you know, you would have all assumed the project was completely destroyed and you wouldn't know what to do. And she would always come in and go, right, this is what we're gonna do. And would have a plan. She was very kind of clear headed at that time, which is exactly what you needed, you know, right there. And I think, you know, without any one of you, I think that's what's interesting. The project couldn't have happened. You know, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, I, I kind of will talk about you a bit. I mean, you're incredible strategist. You know, you're an amazing strategist. But, you know, my hunch is a bit like me is that you may piss people off because you'll probably tell them what you actually think. Luckily, Georgie can bring people with her and and kind of you know coax the best out of them and and actually but without either of those things you know do you know what i mean and spadge picking up the pieces and then you know rachel being incredibly clear about with contractors or whatever so i think the whole you know the whole team is such an extraordinary combination of skills you know yeah i think that's true i mean i think um it is a combination of all of us and that's made it possible. I mean, I think there is, so Naomi and Spadge are the same person. She's my elder sister. And um, I can't begin to tell you how many times she was like, right, get us in a room and basically say, hold your nerve. Like I'd be like weeping in a corner. Rachel would be like throwing things. George would be trying to hold it together. Sally would just be in some sort of existential crisis. And Spadge would just be like, hold your nerve. Like everyone, hold your nerve. And, and that, well, she was always right. And we always did. And it was always okay with some work as well. But um, yeah, you need someone who's going to do that too, I guess. Find someone who will always say that. <laughs> or borrow Spadge every now and then. We've got, Anna holds us together here. Um, I have another question, which I think I'm looking at the time. We've got four minutes left. So this will be our last question. It's from Rob Gregory, but he's got a croaky throat. Um, so he's asked me to ask it on his behalf. And it's funny that I've waited till the end to get a, a man to ask a question. Usually I'm batting them off and getting the women to, to come forward, but that's been the opposite here. Anyway, Rob's question is, what are the next challenges that you face? Jess as part of Onion and Piers as an anti-architect. Jess. I mean, in this building or just generally? Um, generally. Well, you know, I could go down a like near-term social collapse and climate catastrophe route, which, you know, is a biggie um, and which we're <laughs> struggling to think about. I think our immediate challenge here um, is recovering a bit. I think there is, you know, I'm sure this is true of everyone in every sector, but there is a sense of exhaustion that is palpable, um, both amongst our team and amongst the sector, the community sector as a whole, I think, and trying to find a way in which we kind of lift our heads back up and carry on trying to do these things in the face of so many challenges is difficult and particularly during the pandemic has become ever more so difficult and I think people are really really struggling. I guess again for us the solution to that is each other as it always is, um, hold each other up and keep going. I think as an organisation the challenge for us is to um, keep finding ways in which the wider bigger systems picture of this kind of work can get some resonance so it's great this is an amazing project it's really wonderful there will be amazing things that happen in this area i'm sure because of it young people here will get opportunities they couldn't have but it's one tiny place and actually what we need is this in every tiny place and what that means is that the economy is run in a totally different way than it is being run predominantly at the moment because it doesn't work for most people so um yeah, small scale, just keep our heads going, get through Christmas and start again in the new year. Big scale, economic systems change. Bring on, bring uh, on the revolution, Jess. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank, uh, hi, Rob. Shame you're not very well with your voice. Um, I think that one of the questions that a lot of people have asked me and I've asked myself for quite a long time is how do I upscale the idea of working on a project with lots of people and, you know, the, the building I'm sitting in and all the buildings we've done here and all the buildings done at places like Western Birch have been projects that have been kind of single things built by multiple hands and that's what Studio in the Woods is and this project has been super interesting for me because it's upscale that in a way that I could never have conceived and, and what I love about it is instead of just being a building that you think about the making of it as being the thing where there are lots of contingent issues all of the politics become all of those contingent things so I think um, the, the, I would like of course to do more projects of this scale but I think I, I would really like to reflect a little bit more and I'd like to do less work now. I mean, I said to my brother who is an academic, um, what are you gonna do next? He just finished a film. He said, I think I might just read and think for five years. I would really like to do less work because it feels that the work that we do do needs to be increasingly important. And I, and I, I, I genuinely now would like to reflect and wait for a, a different opportunity to come along rather than go looking for it. I don't, I don't know what, it, what it'll be or where it is.